high priest, high priest mm -hmm. and it's not in their birth order, right. but rather it is in the order that they that they receive by the lot. Mm -hmm. So that's the order they go. So if we follow that order, and and also the influences of course of the of the prophetic paradigm in Genesis 49, which of course predicts a tremendous amount of what they will do. Well, it's he's not in the last seven. No. So I'm talking about the last seven. So what happens if okay. you put all of them there? Does it do anything? If you lift all of them and put the words together? <laughs> Sorry. Well, here's what I'm going to um, here's what I'm going to show you. So Benjamin means the son of the right hand, and Simeon means the hearing one, and Zebulun means dwells or dwelling. Mm -hmm. Issachar, the fourth one, means great reward. Asher, the fifth one, means happy or blessed. Sixth one is Naphtali, that is wrestling. And the seventh one, the last to get their inheritance, is Dan. So of those seven, if you put them in their order, mm -hmm. those words with a few connecting words added, here's what I think you, you get is a moldy word anagram. Oh, okay. is that what you wanted in that last It's one? a moldy word anagram. <laughs> okay. And it's actually not here. That's what I want. Oh. Maybe I put it wrong, but so here, I wasn't sure what what you wanted there. <laughs> so here's what it is. Sorry. The son of the right hand is the hearing one, dwelling among us, and great is his reward, for he is happy and blessed in his wrestling for us, being our judge. Okay? Mm -hmm. I think the, the connecting words are implied by the other words, in my opinion, but you could debate that if you want to. Now, like I said, it, those being exactly in that order and making a anagram is, could hardly be coincidental. So, trying to go back to statistics, now I had to pull back. And I could be wrong about the exact formula here. Nerd alert, nerd alert. I was trying to go back to probability, okay? And if someone has a better understanding of this, fine. But here's, here's what I think is true. So, so if you, I counted then all of the characters of the Hebrew names, not in English, but in Hebrew, okay? If you put them in order, there's 50 of them, exactly. All seven guys... All the letters together is 50. I believe the way you figure probability in this case is you take 50th to the seventh power. I think that's right. Okay. Well, if someone has a different formula, good. Because one of us here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. But I think yeah. that's how you do it. All right. Now, that would be the closest. If, if, if I calculate it right, then the chance of it occurring randomly, okay, would be 1 to 781.25 billion. In other words, no chance. All right. No realistic chance that these could be, of those 50 letters, put exactly in that order and come out with their four phrase. So, again, I think I hope it's... you appreciate that it's really short. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I wish I'd have done it shorter. <laughs> See how much you learned, though, in your review? No, and what, what, well, maybe she had yeah. something to... Uh, no. I just, did you go to Old Plow of them? No, I did, I started with, you started with Benjamin. I Correct. with Judah. Okay. No, okay. We're, we're dealing with the last seven. I started seven. Thing, and I just started I to go all the way back. I saw that, too, because of our other... Well, I only got seven. seven. Okay. With Judah. Okay. What did I miss? And the reason why these seven was because God is the one that... That's the last inheritance, we're the seven. He did it as the last group of seven. It. Well, ladies and gentlemen, bring all the Hebrew translations of the names of the last seven tribes together and order and summarize the name. Oh, there wasn't anything wrong with your question. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Really read Could we move on? <laughs> All right. I want to read, I want us to read the 20th chapter. We're going to, we're going to, 
take the 20th and finish it, and then we'll move on next week to the 21st to take it. All right, so let's read it. Joshua 20, starting at verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, Designate the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses. So there's Old Testament references to these cities of refuge, and we're going to look at those two references, two major references. That the manslayer who kills any person unintentionally without premeditation may flee there, and they shall become your refuge from the avenger of blood. And he shall flee to one of these cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and state his case in the hearing of the elders of that city, and they shall take him into the city to them and give him a place so that he may dwell among them. Now, if the avenger of blood pursues him, then they shall not deliver the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor without premeditation and did not hate him beforehand. And he shall dwell in the city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, until the death of the one who is high priest in those days. Then the manslayer shall return to his own city and to his own house, to the city from which he fled. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee, in the hill country of Naphtali, and Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, mm-hmm. in the hill country of Judah, and beyond the Jordan, in other words, to the east side, Jericho, they designate, east of Jericho, they designated Bezer, which is in the wilderness on the plain from the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the appointed cities of all the sons of Israel, for, uh, for all the sons of Israel and for the stranger who sojourns among them, that whoever kills any person unintentionally may flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger blood until he stands before the congregation. Uh-huh. Now, much of Deuteronomy are words of the Lord given to Moses talking about various aspects of law, justice, uh, 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 and various ordinances about how Israel's to run. Okay, a lot of it is found. Some of it's found in Numbers. Some of it's found in other places. But it's very much summarized in the Book of Deuteronomy. Okay. Now we're dealing with one of those elements here called the cities of refuge. I want you to, as we go through this, I want you to pay attention to the very important typologies that you're going to see. This was a real situation. This was how things were organized in Israel. There were six real cities, and there are, you know, we're going to go through the reasons why God set it up this way. But they're also typological. So we're going to try to see their fulfillment in Christ. Now, the moral case against murder begins in Genesis 9-6. Why don't we read it? Go on back. Genesis 9-6. Think how early this occurs in the history of mankind. Of course, we've already had the problem, haven't we? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What is it? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Mm-hmm. So it's already occurred very quickly from the fall of, uh, of man in the garden. We have murder. So in 9-6, God says, whoever sheds man's blood... By man his blood shall be shed, for he, in the image of God, uh, he has made man. So, we learn something very important here. We see here, this begins the issue of capital punishment. It is mandated by God. God says, if a man premeditatedly kills another man, then you... The community shall enact capital punishment. That's what, correct? That's Mm -hmm. part of what 9.6 says. But then it says something else, too. It says that the reason why this is a heinous act, okay, is because, uh, because man is designed 
by God and in God's image, and no one has a right arbitrarily to take a human life. Okay? Now, let me explain something to you by, when we start in this. Okay? There are many, many ways in which, and we're only going to go over one of them, about ways in which a human life can be taken. There's ways that God ta- says that it should be done in certain cases, capital punishment. There's another case, and that's what we call moral warfare. Okay? I mean, obviously, we're in the book of Joshua. Mm-hmm. It's the book of war. And, of course, God is authorizing this, uh, this warfare in this situation. You know, we may have had experiences, and I don't know what all your backgrounds are, of someone who has died uh, in some way, and not a natural death, a death that seemed to be, you know, by accident. Uh, maybe someone has had someone that's been a victim of crime in their family. I don't know what all your backgrounds are in that sense. So I want you to understand we're simply talking about the issue of capital murder intentional taking of a life. That's what we're dealing with here. And then we're talking about the case in which there can be an accident of some sort where a life is taken, but it's not intentional. It's an accidental thing. And we're not going to go into all the cases because it goes into, well, you know, and if a man takes an iron rod, and if a man's, if the ax falls off his uh, you know, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but, but understand, it's very important to understand that the reason why this is a serious thing to God is because every person is created in his image. They're a created being. They're not accidental, okay? They're not the result of, of evolution. They, they are indeed designed by him. Now, it's, there's another thing I think that's very interesting here. God sets the limits of human life. God sets the limits of human life. Turn to Job 14. It's a very interesting verse, Job. I just saw it this week, and that's why I put it in the outline, and I was, I was kind of amazed at what we're told. God tells Job. Job 14, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of turmoil. How about that one for a statement about human life? <laughs> you don't live 500 or 1,000 years, and you're going to have problems. <laughs> That's the first statement. Verse 2, like a flower, he comes forth and withers. You know, look at the baby. Look how the newness of the baby. You know, the, 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 the freshness of the baby. Okay, yeah, their skin, their, you know, and everything about them, you know. And yet you look at someone in a nursing home. What do we say? Withered, I think, is a fair, a fair description, okay? The, 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 the final, the decay of the human body. It says... He also flees like a shadow and does not remain. You know, ever try to stop the sun? Ever start to shot a shadow? It ain't going to happen. And there's a predictable cycle and pattern here. And he says, verse 3, Thou also dost open thy eyes on him and bring him into judgment with thyself. In other words, there's going to be eventual judgment for all human beings. Okay? There's actually going to be two of them. One for the believers one for those that don't believe. And then verse 4, who can make the clean out of the unclean? No one. We're talking about the judgment that will occur. Verse 5, since his days are determined, the number of his months is with thee, and his limits thou hast set so that he cannot pass. In other words, pass beyond them. God knows the month that you will pass, and I will pass away from this earth, literally. Interesting, isn't it? That's how designed we are. You know? Yes? Uh, There are churches that preach and teach predestination. Are they using this to do so? Well, 
It is, it's a predestination in a sense, in the sense that there's a terminal limit to life. And it's really, ultimately, it's encoded in our DNA. If you want to put it technically, at the end, you know, at the ends of the, of, of our, uh, of our DNA, of our chromosomes, there are telomeres. You know what I mean? You know what telomeres are? No. Uh -uh. Telomeres are ends of the strands that each time you go through a cycle cell reproduction, one of them's knocked off. Shortens the cell. It shortens it down. And there's only there's old, only so many there's only so length of telomeres, okay? Some people's telomeres genetically are longer than other people's. Therefore, they will live longer than other people. If an unforeseen thing doesn't happen, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Um, in Psalm 138, he says also... About David, right? Your eyes have been seen my unformed yes. substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Absolutely. So is that the same thing? It is exactly so, the same so thing. So the idea here we read about the 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 idea about immortality is actually nonsense. It, it is not only nonsense; it is absolutely in the face of the Creator. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, and there's a huge effort now. It's called transhumanism. It's to try to genetically alter people mm -hmm. so that you can increase, at, you know, abnormally by technological intervention their length. And if you start to even think casually about that whole concept, there are only six million problems morally that come to your mind, okay? <laughs> I mean, if these people are already talking about the world's overpopulated, what do they think they're doing? <laughs> It's just, it's nuts, okay? But the point is, man, without God, of course, fears death. He doesn't understand his future. He's fearful of his future. And so what does he naturally want to do if he has the technological ability to? Prolong life. life, okay? You know, we have to take a different position. We say the body is aging, it's getting worse, and Lord, thank you, you made a place and a home for me, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, and we have a, a very definite future, so we have a very different view. You know, now, they made these places a refuge. How does this apply when the kings came? And every time a new king came in, he killed all the family of the last king. Well, it, th that's not that's not what the city's refuge are. They're right. specifically for one purpose. They, they are for the manslayer. Mm -hmm. That's the only purpose, okay? So we'll go through it, and we're going to go through the elements, of the, okay, of the cities of refuge. Now, look, note, of course, in, in, in Exodus 2013, we have this very important statement, quote, thou shall not kill. It's the Ten Commandments. But, but that's not really what it says. In the Hebrew, it says, in a better translation is, thou shall not murder. There are many different Hebrew words involved for killing, d killing people or people dying in different ways. The one that's used there is, thou shall not murder. It's the premeditated killing of a person. Okay? Like the kings did. Like the kings did. Okay? Now, it's interesting, of course, that the Lord in this mandates capital punishment for the intentional murderer, okay? And we see this, and we're not going to go here right now, but, um, well, maybe we should. Let's, look, let's go to Exodus 21. Exodus 21. Isn't it interesting all the things we find in the Old Testament we had no idea were, that were there, that are built and designed? Exodus 21. Trump, I'm sorry. I said, where are you finding? Well, I, there, I, I, I find them in here. <laughs> I didn't make it up. <laughs> Exodus 21, 12, 13, 14. Okay? This is one of the beginning statements about this whole issue. 
He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. He strikes him. Intentional, okay? But if he did not lie in wait for him, in other words, he didn't have a plan to try to sneak around and find a way to kill him, okay? But God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint you a place to which to, you may flee. If, however, a man acts presumptuously towards his neighbor so as to kill him craftily, you are to take him even from my altar. In other words, even if he goes and pleads at the altar, okay, that he may be put to death, capital punishment, okay? Now, isn't it interesting how capital punishment has become has become seen in the last especially 40, I'd say 40 years in this country, as this horrible thing? Mm -hmm. If someone is even committed or, or sentenced to a capital punishment, okay, the idea here in this whole thing that God sets up is to create justice, but at the same time have a balance with mercy. That's what he's trying to do. That's what he does in the idea of the cities of refuge. Now, we have distorted the system badly. Even if a person is ultimately sentenced to capital punishment, okay, how long does it take before it might be, might be enacted. Over 30 years. Yes. Now, here's the thing that to me is tragic about it. You, they were going to argue, well, there's some cases in which the person should have been convicted of it. Okay. It's, it's not a perfect system. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you where it's terribly imperfect. It's terribly imperfect to the families of the victim. Mm -hmm. When do they see justice? Mm -hmm. Well, I think they have to be in the mind of forgiving what occurred. If they can't forgive, no matter what happens to the party who is guilty, it doesn't make a lot of difference. That's the only way they're going to cleanse their own soil, soul. I agree with you. And if they don't forgive, uh, there's a lot of things in the Bible that's going to correspond to what yes. I just said. And I, I agree. In the spiritual sense, I absolutely agree with you. But there still is set up here in the cities of refuge, a system of specific justice is designed for a purpose, for many purposes. Okay, if we if we change that significantly, then we're creating imbalance about the injustice. And I tell you, if you create too much imbalance and justice, look at history. What you end up with is a, a revolution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You cannot suppress people in injustice to some point because eventually they'll get to the point that they'll rebel. So justice keeps society stable, and injustice that becomes significant creates revolution. And it, you can go through almost any area of history you want to and see that. Meanwhile, the taxpayers are funding these guys in prison that are living in luxury. Some of them. Well, it's $18,300 a year yeah. what it costs it's, to imprison somebody for a year yeah. in the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. It's different in other states, but that's I'll have a revolution also made because. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. And that's the point. It's a different prison. Anishka just made the statement that's very correct. But even if you get to the point of revolution, that doesn't necessarily create justice. Under any circumstances. No. Think of the French Revolution. It was 20 years of absolute heinous, bloody reprisals constantly. You know, it was a terrible, terrible period in France. Or in Russia, why a revolution occurred, because mm -hmm. those people thought that there is a czar, okay, emperor, mm -hmm. but that's, quote, not fair. You know, we all mm -hmm. should be equal. So it was not really about real justice. It's man-made justice. Yes. It, it, it was, but uh, yeah, why yeah. he's region on four. What's going on in Venezuela today? Well, I got that writers at Argentina. Which one is Venezuela? It? Venezuela is a classic example of what you're referring to, uh, because if you look what happened and how he did away with the laws and rules, which is your justice, that country and those people are suffering unbelievably. Yeah, they are. Very, very, very you horrible. You brought that point up either last yeah. week or the week before. Yeah, I've, it's an it's a <laughs> ongoing horrible collapse of a, of a country. So I, think the, I think the difficulty is, is the word man. 
<laughs> yeah, that is true. If you think about everything you're putting forth here, in the man is of the image of God, but man doesn't function as God. True, and man doesn't understand or accept mankind now will not usually accept their place and their design under the power and leadership of God, and that leads to terrible problems. Turn to Numbers 35. I want I want to read these two sections. Oh, my favorite book. So you that's right. So you understand the two sections here that include all the elements of the cities of refuge. We're going to read first Numbers 35, starting in verse six. And notice the elements here. Okay, starting at 6, Numbers 35. And the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall be the six cities of refuge, which you shall give for the manslayer to flee to. And in addition to them, you shall give 42 cities. So the, Le the Levites get 48 cities. And next week we'll talk about the Levite cities. Now we're talking about the special group called the cities of refuge. All the cities which you shall give the Levites shall be 48 cities together with their pasture lands. They get about 3,000 feet-ish, now more like 3,000 meters maybe, around these cities in which they can use that land to cultivate. They don't own anything else, okay? They get the city and a little bit of the surrounding countryside, and that's the Levites' inheritance, okay? It says, um, as for the cities which you shall give from the possession of the sons of Israel, you shall take more from the larger, and you shall take less from the smaller. Each shall give some of the, of the cities to the Levites in proportion to his possession which he inherits. Verse 9, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall select for yourselves cities to be your cities of refuge that the manslayer who has killed any person unintentionally may flee there. And the cities shall be to you as a refuge from the avenger, so that the manslayer may not, uh, may not die until he stands before the congregation for trial. And the cities which you are to give shall be your six cities of refuge. You shall give three cities across the Jordan, that is, in the east, and three cities in the land of Canaan, they are to be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the sons of Israel and for the alien and for the sojourner, someone traveling through the land, among them, that anyone who kills a person unintentionally may flee there. But if he struck him down with an iron object so that he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. And he struck him down with a stone in the hand, by which he died, and, he, and as a result he did die, he is a murderer. In other words, see the issue of motive here? Okay? Uh, uh, for the murderer shall be put to death. Or if he struck him with a wooden object in the hand, by which he may die, as a result of uh, which he did die, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. The blood avenger himself shall put the murderer to death. He shall put him to death when he meets him. And if he pushed him out of hatred, and threw something at him lying in wait, and as a result he died. And, of course, it goes on and talks about these mm -hmm. cases that identify. Then drop down to verse 24. It says, <clears throat> it says, Then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the blood avenger according to these ordinances. And the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the blood avenger and the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge to which he has fled. And he shall live in it until the death of the high priest who was anointed with the holy oil. Okay? Now, let me pull this all together now. Okay? Now, um, capital punishment was not instituted by the state. Capital punishment was instituted by a person in the family of the victim who is called the manslayer or the avenger of blood. They, they, it's usually the oldest son. He's appointed. And if one of the, the family members dies, then he's appointed to go get the person that did it. Okay? No capital punishment at this point in Israel. 
Okay. Now. Wait, could you please explain that again? Capital punishment if you kill someone to death. Capital punishment was was enacted by the avenger of blood. The avenger of blood was the oldest son of the victim that died, his family. Okay? He's the oldest son. He is appointed the avenger of blood if it occurs. You, you follow? Makes older sense? Older son or older brother? Well, uh, older brother. Yeah. Older whoever. Older whoever, okay? So they take the role in that case of the avenger of blood. And they take off and try to seek the person that, it's a, that has allegedly done this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Therefore, everyone knows if this has happened, if if you have accident, uh, well, accidentally killed someone. Okay, you must flee to the city of refuge because if the avenger of blood overtakes you, mm -hmm. then capital then capital punishment occurs. Then, mm -hmm. if you get to the city of refuge, then you have an initial hearing. Okay. And that, that's what was said in verse uh, verse 25 here. And the congregation shall deliver the manslayer from the hand of the blood avenger. And the congregation, you say, you get an initial hearing. The, the city elders come out. The guy says, hey, I'm here. I need help. The city elders come out. They initially hear the situation to, to determine if there's evidence of intentional murder or unintentional. Okay. If they say, sounds like it's unintentional, then they bring the man into the city of refuge, and the avenger of blood has to stay out. He cannot touch him inside the city of refuge. Now, what happens next is they transfer him under a guard to guard him from the avenger of blood back to his original city or an entire jury trial. Trial, trial by peers mm -hmm. of the congregation tries it. They seek evidence. There has to be at least two or more witnesses. Remember, there's, a, there's the rule of witnesses. You can't have one person that is not convincing. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have to have two or three testimony that corroborate each other. If he, if it's found that it is unintentional, person he killed accidentally, then they take him back to the city of refuge where he fled, and that's where he stays until the high priest in Israel dies. So if the high priest dies in one year, then he's let go from the city of refuge then. If it takes 40 years before the high priest dies, then he must live in the city of refuge for 40 years because that's the way God set it up. Is there any or reasoning for that? It's the only place he had refuge. No, but I mean, yeah, the, high priest, the, long, long, the, high priest, the high priest died. It's just like the Jubilee year. It's 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 a time where there's the resetting of things. Okay. okay? But, the time of resetting. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, now, if it, once the high priest dies and he's released, can the blood avenger get him then? No. Once the high priest dies, then his term is over. Okay. That's it. Can Done. Sealed. Yes. Okay. So if the blood avenger gets to him before he gets to the city of refuge, is that okay in God's sight that he has killed them? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. All right. It is. Only Jack. in there to look, to look bad. Yeah. How does that apply? To, well, sorry, how does that apply to our cities of refuge today for non-citizens? Maybe taken sanctuary, sanctuary cities. cities. <laughs> yeah. The answer is it doesn't apply. It's a totally different thing. It has no application has whatsoever. No application. So they can come in and take a person who's not a citizen out of the court city. The, the, well, sanctuary sanctuary city. City. Yes, they well can. they're illegal by they're federal illegal. law. The sanctuary city by itself is totally illegal. Yeah. Okay. And okay. ICE can come in, or any police officer if chosen, can come in and confiscate that person and take him. They can try to. Unless you're in California, and good luck. But it's, <laughs> yeah. it's legal to kill the illegal before you get into the city. No. <laughs> okay. 
Now, there's one more element here, Don't too. Don't add to it. Okay? Okay, there's one more element here that I want you to notice. I want you to see in Numbers 35, um, I want you to see verses 31 and 32. This, I think, is very interesting. 31 and 32 or 33 and 34? 31 and 32, I believe. Numbers 35, 31, 32. Okay? Mm-hmm. It's right after it says, and here's what it says. Well, let me start in 30. If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death, there, if it's an intentional homicide, at the evidence of, of witnesses, but no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Mm-hmm. 31. Moreover, you shall not take ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. In, ter- in our terms, no plea bargains. Mm-hmm. No plea bargains. Do you realize how many plea bargains go on? Yeah, well, 95%. That's exactly right. Yeah, because prosecutors don't want to go to the point of prosecuting, and they stack up charges on people, and then they basically make them plea. It's a crap system we've, we've developed. Okay. You are absolutely correct. Okay. Third, this is exactly what's happening, by the way, if you want to know, with Cohen, Trump's lawyer, they're charging. Mueller is doing one thing. He's trumping up as many charges as he can on Cohen to try to get him to, you know, accept some of them. Okay? Mm-hmm. Plea deal it. He's trying to plea deal it. It may not happen. Well, it may not, but, I, but that's what he's doing. There is an issue that occurred today by phone, and that was Trump called Putin. Are you aware of that? No, I haven't seen the news today. And when he called Putin, he's made arrangements for him to come to the United States, and Putin accepted. Good. Mueller will be out of there before Putin puts a foot on the United States soil. I hope. You think not? I hope. He's made up his mind that that's going to occur. Why did they? Why did the Democrats today introduce a bill in the Senate to prohibit the firing of yeah. Mueller? Yeah. They know it's like what you're reading here, except there's no plea bargaining in this case. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you'd find that interesting. Yeah, it is. What does it mean, plea bargain? Fred? A plea bargain means Same you money? you. Well, you negotiate you negotiate a settlement of the legal case. You say it's like, for instance, let's say I'm charging you with these five things, okay? But I'll drop three of them if you agree to these two. That's a plea bargain, okay? And it's the way the American system has become. It is well, many times, okay? Now notice also. And they pressure them into a time slot and say, yeah. you have to make up your mind within the next yes. two hours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it, it also, it, so it also says in verse 32, and you shall not take ransom for him who has fled to the city of refuge, that he may return to live in the land before the death of the high priest. You can't plea bark in that either. Mm-hmm. If he's found to be an un, unintentional murder, then he is committed to the term in that city of refuge until the high priest dies. That's it. Mm-hmm. Okay? What does the high priest have to do with dying in it, terms of what we're because, talking about? Because it becomes the resetting of the whole Levitical system again. Because a new high priest is appointed. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's just an event that occurs that's significant because... You know, all of the political things then have to be kind of reorganized. High, a new high priest has to be picked. And yeah, it's it's, it's it was much, something appointed by God. It's, it's much like the jubilee. I say it was something appointed by God. Period. Yeah. The whole thing, right? It's like the jubilee year. It's a reset. Okay. Every fiftieth year. Reload the system. Reload the system. And but it, but of course it's a brilliant design because it's God's design because. For instance, look now, I don't want to go too far off, but look at the, the structure of the debt this country has. It's an unimaginable level of debt when you put all of it together. 
it couldn't happen under under God's system because at the end of 50 years, all debts are canceled. So you can't keep accumulating this massive debt, okay? The country had to get rid of it, and the individuals got rid of it in the 50th year. So you had a reset. So I'm afraid we were going to have a reset pretty soon, just too, but it ain't going to be very pretty. So, yeah. All right, now, here's the question. Having gone through these elements of the cities of refuge, what is the application to the New Testament believer? Is there an application to the New Testament believer? I'm going to suggest that we have the answer found in Hebrews. So turn to Hebrews chapter 6. I'm sorry, did you say he's talking about blood that files the land? Um, it is under B. Oh, I'm sorry, B. Well, it, yeah, the idea is that, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I did skip that. We were getting into this. Yeah, let me, let me mention that. In, in, in Numbers 35, there is the statement about blood defiling the land. In other words, it's an admonition by God that God expects any society to implement real justice. Mm -hmm. he will, in other words, if justice is not served, it's like an accumulating moral debt in that nation. Right. It keeps accumulating and accumulating, and that leads inevitably to the judgment of God. Mm, that's interesting. Okay? Without, and, and you look at, go through Egypt, go through Babylon, go through Assyria, name any system, and when it becomes morally corrupt, corrupt to a certain point, something big happens. So okay? you say here the cities of refuge are a beautiful balance between the need for justice versus fairness compassion. Right, exactly. That, that there's a justice system for real justice, but there's also a compassion also. Mm -hmm. So... It talks That's about why they don't give give the, the person right into the hands of, of the avenger of blood. Michael. Are we there with what we're doing as a nation? <laughs> That's why I put in what I put in. I said, does this cause you any sense of foreboding? Uh -huh, uh -huh. What do you think God is going to expect with 60 million abortions in this country. That's what I'm thinking of. That's just one. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's just one issue. Yeah. Do you think he's going to continue to allow it without Absolutely avenging it? Absolutely not. He will not. It's a debt that we're accumulating. Mm -hmm. This is what the non-Christian world does not understand. They're accumulating a massive moral debt, and it will be paid. God guarantees it. I can show you any number of places you want to look at mm -hmm. to say God eventually says, that's it. Is there a number that we reach? <laughs> that's why I said, does this I cause you any foreboding? I think we're already over it. Well, I think, are we, have over we over. reached terminal velocity? Yeah. Yeah, we're getting close. Well, that's a, terminal velocity. Yeah, that's a good, interesting <laughs> way to put it, Michael. All right, Hebrews 6. I want to read two verses. This isn't a discussion that is, that is occurring here about the Abrahamic covenant and God's promises. And I'm, I'm, not, so I'm not going to go through the whole discussion with you. I'm just going to read 17 and 18. He says, in the same way, God desiring even more to show the heirs of his promise, of course, the first heir was Abraham, and everyone who believes, as Abraham believed, is also a child of Abraham, right? In faith, okay? He says um, uh, that the, uh, to show the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of God's purpose mm -hmm. interposed with an oath, that oath being his promises, in order that by two unchangeable things, and but what he's going to say is, the first one is the unchangeableness of the Abrahamic covenant, and then the unchangeableness of God's character. Those are the two unchangeable things that he's talking about. In which it is impossible for God to lie, that we may have strong encouragement. 
I like that. <laughs> I like it when God says, I'm giving you strong encouragement. That's a good thing, good sign. He says, we who have fled for refuge in laying a hold of the hope set before us. Say? That the first is untendable of Abraham's covenant. Yes. And the second? God's own character. Uh -huh. Okay? That we, in that same way as they, have fled to the refuge. But who is our refuge? It's not a city. It's Christ. It's Christ. Yes. He is our refuge. So I think we have a reason to say there's application here to the New Testament believer. So let's go through the applications. Again, remember, it's typological. It's, some, it's a way Israel was set up that it applies spiritually. And its fulfillment is in the New Testament. I said it's typological. The cities of refuge are a type. Their fulfillment is in the New Testament. So I'm going to show you how they're fulfilled. Okay? So, let's go through some elements here. The manslayer had to leave everything in his former life to be protected in the city of refuge. Everything he earned, his family, everything he had to leave. He could take whatever was on his back. That's what he took in the city of refuge. So we'll leave our old Okay? Place. Right. So let's look at Philippians chapter 3. You're in Hebrews, so turn back to Philippians chapter 3. Let's see how it applies. Philippians 3, starting verse 7. Here's what Paul says. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing him, knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order that I may attain Christ. Okay? It's completely running to the city of refuge, dropping everything in the past for the goal of getting to the city. Christ is our refuge. But does it mean rubbish? Rubbish means literally dung. dung. Poop. <laughs> That's what it means in the Greek. That's what it means. So, so, what, so, let's go to the second thing here. What's the second element? The city of the refuge were appointed by God and were not human inventions. Let's turn to Romans chapter 3. Go to your left to Romans chapter 3. Starting in verse 21. He's, Paul says, But now apart from the, from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction in this very important verse, for we all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. That's the standard. God's character. Okay? All fall short. And then he goes on and says, being justified as a gift by his grace to the redemption which is in Jesus Christ. That's God's plan. It doesn't come from us. Right. We don't earn it. Right. It's God's plan. It's his gift. It's his grace given to us. Now, also, let's go to the third one. The city's refuge were designed to provide shelter and protection for the guilty. We just read it. Verse 23 of Romans 3. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone's guilty before God. Only the guilty person could enter the city of refuge. Yeah, that's interesting. Only the guilty, not the righteous. Mm -hmm. right. Only the guilty. So that's your qualifying beginning. You had to be guilty. Now, they were placed prominently and well marked. Now, we didn't go through all the verses in Deuteronomy 19, but you might want to read them on your own. Verses 1 through 13, Deuteronomy 19, says some very interesting things. It says that once a year in the spring, 
they had to maintain the roads to the six cities. Okay? They had to, if there were rocks there, if there were holes, if there was overgrowth, they were obligated in the spring to go out and clear it all out so that there's a, a, a very clear path that, that, that people could run to the city of refuge. Not only that, they had signage. Literally. They had signage. Big signs said that way. Big signs. They had, they had to maintain the signs but to tell only, people the way. With only three cities on each side of the Jordan, mm -hmm. they weren't close together. But they weren't far apart. If you start to look at a map, you, you're no more than about 15 miles from any one city. Right, yeah. Close. Yeah. And yet it seems like a, it's nothing to us today, but back then, yeah. 15 miles. Oh, yeah. It had to be a day. You could get there in a day. You had to be around that. If you look at a map, it's about that distance from any place. And if they had yeah. special roads, what's to say that the man slayer wouldn't say, oh, well, he's going to be taking that road? Well, he will know he's going to take that yeah, road right. because everyone knew the roads. Right. It no. was like saying, well, you know, I-71, well, everyone knows I-70. Well, everyone knew the route to the six cities. Right. So, so yeah, be fleet to sea. he better move. He better hustle, okay? <laughs> yeah. So they were prominently marked. Now, you don't have to turn it off. I'll, I'll read it for you. It's in Matthew 5. Tim, can I yes. make a comment? Yes. To utilize the point of 15 miles, if a wagon train heading west in the early days 15 miles was unheard of to make. Yes, tough. You use that as a comparison to your point. Yes. That's but from here to, to Morris Road, road fish. from here to Morris Road, good luck with some miles. Well, yeah. see, it all depends if oh, it was well, uphill or down. Yeah. <laughs> if you were walking so, around a donkey. So let me, let me give you an analogy. They were, they were pro the cities of refuge were also placed on hilltops. They're placed on hilltops. They, oh. So everyone could see them. So everyone could see them. Every one of these cities is on a hilltop. Oh. Okay? Now, so uh, let me read you Matthew 5, 14. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Mm -hmm. Quite an interesting analogy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay? So do you think Jesus... Jesus talks here about that city? I think so. I think that's exactly what he had in mind. I, I can't prove it, but it's an absolute analogy here. You know, uh -huh. remember, remember when they went when after Christ died? Okay, these two guys are walking on this road. Uh -huh. All right, and they're talking to each other about this whole big thing that happened in Jerusalem, and this guy was killed, and he was crucified, and they and and so. All of a sudden, Jesus shows up right there. He walks with them. They don't recognize him, though. It yeah, says they don't recognize him. Okay? And, and Jesus says, what's going on, guys? Okay? And they start telling him all How about these. you know? Yeah. Are you, Are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know this? Know. He goes, no, tell me. Tell me. Okay? So they tell him all this stuff, and they go to that evening to stop and to eat. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, he, he breaks bread, gives it to them, and immediately they see it's Messiah. But it says, and he explained to them on the way all the law and the prophets concerning him. Yeah. He goes through all these prophecies about him. And he explains them all to them as they walk along. Now, there's a Bible study. <laughs> there's a Bible study. You got any means to get something like that? <laughs> no. no. No, I'm the wrong person to do that. Okay, so next, we can see another fulfillment. They were, like I said, they were clearly marked with signs, and the roads were maintained. You find that in Deuteronomy 19, verse 3, on a yearly basis. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And let's see another New Testament fulfillment here. We're going to look at verses 8 and 13. Verse 8 says, 
But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. So how far away is the kingdom to any one person? It's always near. Okay? And then drop down to verse, uh, I think it's verse 13, isn't it? Yeah, drop to 13. For whoever will call upon his name, the name of the Lord will be saved. You always have opportunity. Constantly. It's always there. It's, uh, okay? It's always accessible. Now, number six. The cities of refuge are easily accessible, as no, as I said, no one lives more than 10 or 15 miles from any one. Turn to Psalm 34. What's the fulfillment then? I think it's a beautiful fulfillment in Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And we're going to look at verse 18. This is a beautiful statement in the Psalms. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Always near. In any affliction, one can always turn to him. He's always near. Now, next, let's talk about the next uh, analogy here or, or fulfillment in the New Testament. The manslayer had to abide in the city for constant protection. All right? And abide for constant protection. Turn over all the way to your right to 1 John. Almost at the end of the New Testament. 1 John. And we're going to look at chapter 2. First John 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, he may have, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. Okay? You won't shrink away from him if you know him. You only shrink away if you don't know him. Okay? If he's familiar to you and you see him coming, what are you going to do? You're going to run to him. You're going to run to your father. Okay? So he says we must abide in him. Same concept as Christians. We abide in Christ. Now, interestingly, it states in Numbers 35 that, of course, this was available to both the Jew and the Gentile. Remember? It said if you're, if you're a countryman, or if you're a visitor, or if you're just a surge, sojourner going through the country, this principle still applies to you. So turn, since you're John, you're still in the New Testament, turn to Romans 10. Back to Romans 10. Well, you should be able to really know your Bible pretty soon here. We're going from one end to the other all the time, so everything in between. So Romans 10, verse 12. What's the fulfillment? For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord for all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. See? There's an analogy again. Now, it was the death of the high priest which secured the permanent release of the manslayer. Turn to your right to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse 14. Yeah. So what's it say? Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And then he goes on and says, For we do not have an, uns an unsympathetic high priest who doesn't understand our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things that we are yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in the time of health and need. It says 
he is he has passed through the heavens. In other words, he's died, he's resurrected, and he's passed through the heavens. So that's what I thought. So, so this, the death of our high priest, Jesus, is actually sets was, us free. Was the step of the system. Absolutely, absolutely. Very good. That, that, I think it's pretty direct analogy. It is. So all these are prophetic fulfillments found in the New Testament. Remember, the Old Testament, the New Testament explains the images in the Old Testament. It's all there. So these cities of refuge all have their typological application. Now, it's also interesting about the names of the six cities. Let me tell you what they mean. Kadesh means holy. What has Christ done? He's made us his holy ones. That's what the word saint means. Okay, we're all saints in the kingdom of God. Shechem means shoulder or safety. We flee to Christ because he is our safety. Hebron means fellowship. It's because of Christ that he started the church and we can have fellowship with each other. Bezor means a fortified place or a refuge or a fortress. As we said, Christ becomes our refuge. We saw it there in Hebrews. Ramoth means height of exaltation, to be lifted up. We are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, it says, and I think it's in Ephesians 1. I didn't write it down. Exaltation. And Golan means joy. What did Jesus say? This joy I have, I will give to you. Right? He's our joy. So to summarize, let's turn to Psalm 46, and we'll stop tonight. Psalm 46. I think this is a beautiful psalm that really summarizes a, a tremendous amount of what we covered here. I think you covered a lot here. Yeah. It's and it's only nine. And it's only nine verses. <laughs> All right. Psalm 46. Now think carefully about what this says. It's a beautiful psalm and beautiful images. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. Remember these things that we've talked about in the city of refuge? He's always there. He's a refuge. He's our strength. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, and that's sure occurring. Mm -hmm. We've never had more earthquakes going on in one time than than we've had in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. It's an unbelievable volume of earthquakes. Many of them many quakes, two or three on the scale, but just a tremendous abundance. They're going on in Oklahoma. They're going on San Francisco on the same day had an earthquake, a hailstorm, and a tremendous amount of rain on the same day, okay, last week. They should be paying attention. He says, <clears throat> he says, even though the earth should change, even though the mountains should slip into the heart of the sea, That would be a major earthquake, Uh okay? Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at at, at its swelling pride, there is a river whose, whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and he will not be moved. God will help her. When morning dawns, what is he speaking of there? In the book of Revelation, in the last chapter, we see this coming down out of heaven. It's called the the city, the New Jerusalem, the city of God in which everyone will dwell. And it describes what it would be like. This is what he's talking about. Verse 6, the nations made an uproar, literally revolt. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice. The earth melted. What does it say in Peter one day? That God will take the present earth and will melt it. Pull it apart, atom by atom, and then put it back together again. That will be the new earth. Just like the big... With a shout and the roar, yeah, the elements will melt, it says in Peter. Now, where are all the people when it's melting and put back together? The people are either in hell, 
They've been judged or they're with the Lord. Okay. Okay. And they're, you know, with him when they're with the resurrection bodies or new bodies waiting for the new creation. Okay. Remember when, 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 when Genesis three happened and sin occurred, they began a process that was going to corrupt everything mm -hmm. down to the literal atoms and molecules. All corrupted. All were subjected to entropy. Is Adam the smallest? Yeah, the little, well, they're smaller than atoms. There's quarks and there's hadrons and there's but anyway, all the subparticles. But the point is God takes that and recreates it all. He takes the matter that's fallen. He tears it all apart and puts it all back together so it's without flaw. That's the new earth. And then, of course, there's the new heavens also. Well, that's after the millennium. That is after, well, yeah, yes, after the millennium. Yes, Jack. This is not before the millennium. After. After. Okay, then he says, he says, he says, then the Lord of hosts, that is, remember, the Lord of his angelic army, the Lord, the, the, the Tosaba, mm -hmm. is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. It's good to know. When things don't look so good, just remember, there is an angelic army that's behind you somewhere. Okay? That's cool. He yeah. mm -hmm. says, come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He's going to judge it. Okay? Mm -hmm. He makes wars to cease, uh, uh, to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, that is the means of war, and cuts the spears in two. When does that happen? When the millennium starts. No more war, okay? The nations are not allowed. He burns the chariots with fire. And then he says, cease striving. This is this beautiful verse. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, our refuge. So, that's the cities of refuge. Oh, that's good. Yeah, Next yeah. week, we will talk about the Levitical cities, the other 48, and talk about some of their applications. Then, after that, we have the conclusion of the book of Joshua. It's chapters 22, 23, and 24. And I'm not going to take them verse by verse. I'll highlight the major parts of those. The most famous part being the 24th, which is the farewell address of Joshua, when he is 110 and the Lord says, all right, buddy, it's time. You're coming home. And, of course, uh, and finally he dies, and that's at the very end. So, okay? Um, Thank you. Very good. And would you...